What's up, YouTube? Ryan here. Welcome back to 1517 Films, where on every episode, I'm always contending for the faith once for all delivered to the saints. And today, we continue on through the story of our faith, our confessions that are worth dying for. Today, it's all about baptism. Stick around. <music> I have missed this series. I have missed it quite a bit. I missed it so much, in fact, I actually had to pick up my Book of Concord and find where we were and, oh, the joy that filled me when I found out that it was baptism. So, if you are new to the channel and you are interested in actual, historic, biblical, Christian theology in a modern age... This is the channel for you. Be sure to subscribe, like any videos that you find relevant, share them where they're needed, and meet me down in the comment section with questions, comments, concerns, funny stories. I love it. So today we're talking about baptism, and it's right on the heels of where we've been. If you've been following the Story of Our Faith series, you realize that I'm going through the Augsburg Confession article by article, but rather than just dealing with these as theological dissertations on this, that, or the other topic in one article form or another. This is a historical document. Look, this is our faith. This is what we believe. This is what we teach. This is what we confess. And that confession that we make to the world, just like when the Augsburg Confession was presented, it should be something we are willing to lay down our life for rather than forsake. And every article, that's why we're going through it one article at a time. We should not want to let anyone take away from us one small piece of our faith. Either we have all of our faith or none of it. So where have we been? Well, there is a God and we are not him. That was article one. Original sin, which is an incredibly important article because half of Christianity today flat out denies it. And original sin is going to play a part in our discussion in baptism. Then, what about original sin? Well, there's Jesus, who became man, was crucified, died, buried, rose again, ascended into heaven for us. Then there are the pastors, or then there, I'm sorry, then there's the justification that we are declared righteous before God because of what Jesus did. There are the pastors that are called to minister this to us. There is the new obedience that comes to us from this, the delight in keeping of God's word, not because of any work worthy it or merit in us, but because it is that likewise is a gift from God. And then there is the church where we're even amongst many denominations, the church, the true church exerts on earth exists, maybe not so much in a denomination, but where the word is rightly taught and the sacraments are rightly administered. And the next article we just got done with way long time ago, chapter eight, what if those sacraments are administered by evil men. Well, the church is still the church, and the sacraments, the validity of God's promise attached to water or to bread or to wine or even to confession and absolution, those promises stand secure when the man dealing out the goods does not. So now we're on to baptism. So we know who God is. We know that we are sinful. We know who Jesus Christ is. We know that we've been justified. We know that the we know this because the pastors tell us, and they tell us in the church where they administer to us what the sacraments. So we're on to the next article of our faith, Article Nine, Baptism. Concerning baptism, our churches teach that baptism is necessary for salvation, Mark sixteen sixteen. And that God's grace is offered through baptism, Titus 3, 4 through 7. They teach that children are to be baptized, Acts 2, 38 through 39. Being offered to God through baptism, they are received into God's grace. Our churches condemn the Anabaptists who reject the baptism of children and say that children are saved without baptism. So little paragraph, a lot of theology. So there's some bold things that I said there, huh? Baptism is necessary for salvation. Absolutely. Whoever believes and is baptized. Or when Jesus said, you must be born again of water and the spirit. This was not necessarily negotiable. You must be born again of water and the spirit. But Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved stands true. 
So we say baptism is necessary. But then Jesus says, whoever does not believe is condemned already. So saved is dependent on baptism. Condemned, not dependent on an absence of baptism. You see, this brings us to original sin. Condemned is a condition already. If you are condemned, you're condemned already because you have not believed in the name of the only Son of God. Your original sin, your concupiscence, your sinful nature, you are condemned already. Whoever believes and is baptized shall be saved. So the state of condemnation is not dependent upon an absence of baptism, but whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, and you must be born again of water and the Spirit. So yes, baptism is necessary for salvation, but not as an act of obedience, as a gift from God, as we read in Titus chapter 3. Now, maybe some of my evangelical friends are going to turn to Titus chapter 3, look at it and go, that verse has nothing to do with baptism. I would refer you back to any other video that I've ever done because I don't like repeating myself. Baptizo means to wash with water in Koine Greek, the language of the New Testament. It does not mean to immerse as it once did at the time of ancient Greek before the more modern Koine Greek. So baptizo, baptize, means to wash with water. And baptizo, baptism, is a word that was transliterated, not translated, from the original Greek. Baptizo was transliterated into baptism, so that's why we call it baptism. But those who were reading the New Testament in Greek were translating it, reading it. So when they read the word baptizo, they read washed with water. So it, they could easily draw comparisons between any time the New Testament used a variation of the form nipto, which means I wash, or baptizo, uh, to wash with water. They could see the similarities, which is why they saw in Titus and in other places that you wouldn't normally think are about baptism. They saw baptism because when they read baptizo, they meant when you were washed with water. So they applied other verses of being washed, like when Paul says, but you were washed. Or when uh, it says in the book of Ephesians that Jesus has sanctified his church by the washing of water with the word, which is why Luther's small catechism says that baptism is God's promise attached to and comprehended in the water, which is what makes it a baptism. The, if you'll notice now, there's a condemnation here. So this was written during the time of the Lutheran Reformation, that big mm -mm, between who? Rome and the Lutherans, and also the Lutherans and the radical reformers. The Lutherans fought the Reformation on, with both hands. Rome on this side, the radical reformers on this side. So while we affirm what baptism is, which had gotten a little bit skewed by uh, the Roman Catholic Church at that time, they, something to the effect of baptism is like getting some fuel in your tank and it's your responsibility to keep it filled up. Um, so a little skewed, but still the necessity of baptism, and especially the necessity of baptism for children, the Lutherans clung to it because it was biblical. But the radical reformers, the Anabaptists, said that we should not baptize babies. But Acts 2, what is it? Uh, what did we say? 2, 38 through 39, clearly says that baptism is for children. The other question I'll have, uh, or the other statement I'll make, and then we'll, we'll get this one wrapped up uh, for this episode. Uh, I just, I love talking about baptism. Uh, an absence of evidence is not an evidence of absence. So because the New Testament does not instruct or give example of actual babies being baptized, most modern day Christians will say that means you're not supposed to. But an absence of evidence is not the evidence of absence. Just because the Bible doesn't say it doesn't mean you can't do it. The Bible also doesn't say you can drive a car. But you can. <laughs> Obviously. There... And there's a reason the Bible says you doesn't say you can drive a car. Cars weren't invented yet. There's a reason the Bible doesn't say one way or the other to baptize babies. And that's because in the first century brain, there was not I am father, you are mother, y'all are children. There was family, one, a single unit. This sense of individuality that we have in the 21st century did not exist in the first, which is why then you do read in the New Testament that whole households were baptized when the father converted. You 
and your household, the New Testament says, doesn't it? That's why it says that. And it doesn't say babies one way or the other because were there a baby culturally in the mind of the reader, the reader knew and understood that the baby would be included as well because that was the culture in which the New Testament was written. And what does uh, the Bible say to us in the fullness of time? Christ came forth. So when everything was just right for the gospel message to be proclaimed, to be written down and spread to all the ends of the earth, that's the culture that was chosen for these words to be given. And we, in our modern mind, need to run them through the filter of the first century mind to rightly understand them. Baptism is not an act of obedience. It's not an outward sign of an inward reality. You will never find that language in the Bible. Baptism is a gift of God. It, baptism is God burying you into Christ Jesus' death and raising you with him by the power of his resurrection to newness of life. And it's a promise that those of us who have been buried with Christ by baptism, Romans 6, and walked with him in newness of life will also share in a resurrection like his. That's right. Baptism is necessary for salvation because those who are baptized will be raised with Christ on the last day. This baptism by itself is truly a confession worth dying for. I'm Ryan, and until next time, may God richly bless you in the grace and mercy won for you by Jesus' vicarious death on the cross for all of your sins.